Well, uh, if you've heard me uh, over the years uh, speak, you know I, I, I have always been attracted to and fascinated by unusually gifted people. You know, people who accomplish great things, you know, like great athletes or scientists or military heroes. And I'll tell stories about people like that in my sermons, but sometimes I'm just attracted to people who just can do weird things, weirdly interesting things, and kind of the weirder the better. For example, I did looked around um, on Google, uh, one of my friends, uh, this past week, and I found a story about a guy named Michael Kearney. Way back in 1984, Michael became the youngest person ever to graduate from college in North America. He was 10 years old. I read the story. He could read. He first read when he was 10 months old. Unusual. Kind of weird. Um, how about this one? Uh, Howard Berg is a speed reading expert. He claims to be able to read 25,000 words a minute. If you're wondering, how fast is that? Well, it means he could read a 400-page book in less than five minutes. How would you like to have that guy in your, in your book club group, right? Lu Chao of China can recite pi, you know the number, to 67,890 digits. Well, first question would be like, why? But, you know, 3.14, blah, 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 blah whatever. Um, but all these people as unusually gifted as they are, pale in comparison to a man I'm going to tell you about right now. A man I saw uh, some 30 years ago, and what he did is just seared into my memory. Uh, shortly after we were married, my wife and I uh, moved to South America, to Bolivia, where we uh, were assigned on a six-month short-term mission experience. We lived in a city called Santa Cruz. Both of us taught English in a small evangelical university there. Just had a wonderful time, met some wonderful people. And I don't remember what we were doing or where we were going, but we came across a crowd of people just in a street, on the side of a street somewhere. And they were all gathered around, excitedly watching a street performer in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. So I was curious, and so we sort of nudged our way to the front, and there was this guy. It, uh, he was a 50 50-ish looking, looking guy in terms of years, and he was wearing colorful sort of gypsy-looking clothing. And um, he was brandishing... I don't know what he had done before we got there, but he was holding a hammer in his hand and a two-by-four. And he was just, he was jabbering away in Spanish, and with all the noise, I could understand a little Spanish, but I couldn't really tell what he was talking about. But he was, had a two-by-four and a hammer, and people are paying, people are watching him. And then he, he grabbed a nail, a big nail, and he pounded it into the two-by-four, like partway, like halfway and like that. Just so we could see, I guess, that the nail was real. You could hear it and stuff. He pounded it in. Then he held the board up, and then he pulled the nail out so it was straight, and he pulled it out, and then he, he held this nail up to his face, and he was saying some things. I just still couldn't tell what he was saying, what he was going to do, and then all of a sudden, he turned the nail, and he hammered it straight into his nose. I, I did the same thing. I, I was like, oh, I want, people started screaming. He, you could hear it, tack, 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 and it's going right into his nose. And there was like this much of it sticking out. I can't, I wish I could show you, but I can't. And then he took another nail, hammered it right into the other nostril. Tick, 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 tick. You could hear it. And people are yelling. And I wanted to look away, but, but it was awesome. I was watching this thing. It was just an amazing thing. Amazing gift. I have no idea how you learn how to do that. Maybe as a child, you know, he figured out. But uh, actually, this guy is not that guy. But I found a picture of this guy's in California. And he's famous for the same exact stunt. He calls it the blockhead trick. And it's not a fake nail. Actually, your, brain, your head has like cavities or something. And if you do it right, you can, I, he does that. I thought two things at the time when I saw my guy in Bolivia. I thought, how do you learn to do that? And I thought, this is going to be a sermon illustration someday. And it was. <laughs> We're in a series now called Uncomfortable Grace. That might be the best lead into an uncomfortable grace sermon of all time. And so far, we've learned that grace stands at the very center of what we call the gospel. Uh, but when we truly understand grace in all its facets, there's always something a little uncomfortable about God's grace. And this week we're going to look a little bit deeper yet into the mystery of grace. We're going to be in a passage in the book of Romans tonight. I'm going to bounce around a lot because Paul makes some assumptions here. So be ready. I have a lot of texts we're going to go through. But mainly we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. And let me read these verses to you. Paul is writing to a young church in Rome that he's never visited up to this point in his life. He writes, For by the grace given to me, 
I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one of, of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now we're going to pause there because he goes on to some other subjects. The first thing I think we want to look at in this teaching about grace is what I'm going to call the humility of grace. Paul wants to teach that young church and us about the humility of grace. Many of you know that my wife and I met uh, years ago at Taylor University. She was a student and I was working on the university staff as a basketball coach and admissions counselor. I think they actually have rules about that sort of thing now. If you're on staff, you, you can't date students, but they didn't have them then. Um, and in the fall of her junior year, she got a job, uh, it was called a student work-study job, in the admissions office. And as it turns out, her little workstation that she was at a couple hours every day was, was directly across from the doorway to my little workstation which probably was in direct result of my mother's 20 years of prayer for me to find someone. But she's out there, and I'm in here. And so um, to make a long story short, I decided that while my, part of my job was recruiting students to Taylor University, I thought I might as well, because it was in my best interest, to recruit her too. So that's what I set out to doing. And so I found reasons to strike up conversations. She was right out there, you know, and, and walked by. How's the typewriter working? It was back in the days we had typewriters, not computers. And I would find reasons to invite her to help me with a college fair at a local high school. And that was great because she'd get extra work hours. I got a date out of it and she didn't even know it. You know, so that's the way that whole thing worked. Well, one day, she's sitting at her workstation, you know, right out there. And I'm sitting at my little work area. And I don't remember what I was doing, you know, phone calls, typing up something, looking through folders, whatever. But I, happened, I was sitting on a, I had a little, one of those little swivel chairs with wheels on the bottom. And as a lot of guys do, I tended to like to I'd lean on it and lean back a little bit, you know. You know, your mother always tells you don't lean back, you know. But I would lean back and stuff. So I was sitting on this little swivel chair. And I looked out, and she, was, she turned and looked at me. So not wanting to miss the chance to make significant eye contact, I kind of turned like that to see her. And right as I turned, you know, to, to greet, to, to make that eye contact, my, the wheel slipped. And I, it went, flipped right over my back, <laughs> legs up in the air. Do you have any idea how hard it is to look cool when your legs are, hey, how you doing? <laughs> to this day, when we tell that story, sh she can't stop laughing because she still remembers what that looked like. But at the end of the day, it kind of worked. But needless to say, that was a humbling experience. But Paul says here, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now, what's he doing here? He's doing three things in this one verse. First, he's establishing his authority to teach. He says, by the grace given to me. Now, we've already learned that the basic meaning of the word grace is gift. And we usually use it to refer to the gift of God's salvation in Christ. But Paul, right here, is not talking about grace like that. He's talking about a specific kind of grace that came to him that made him an apostle, that gave him the authority to teach the gospel and to lead the church. We'll talk more about this kind of grace and gifting in just a moment. But secondly, he's also warning about spiritual pride. I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now it seems to me that the only reason for Paul to write something like this is that it was actually happening in the church in Rome. Some subtle form of spiritual pride was happening in that little congregation. Maybe someone thought themselves to be a, a, little, uh, a little higher in intelligence, knew more about God's word, and deserved a little higher place, deserved a little more respect, who, whatever it was. And this is where it gets a little bit uncomfortable because he's speaking directly to spiritual pride. My, my father, who I tell lots of stories about, was a pastor and still is, but was a pastor in a local church for well over 50 years. And he says that in all that time, all those sermons, he only once ever put together a sermon aimed at one person. 
in one of his churches, I don't remember which one, small church, there was a woman, you can think of her as sort of a church lady, who just had a critical spirit, who was critical about almost everything. She could find something negative to say about almost everything and everyone. And my father discerned that it was a form of her spiritual pride. And so he decided he was going to preach to her one Sunday. So he put together a sermon that spoke directly to her sinful attitudes and critical spirit. And he preached up a storm. And he would make eye contact with her. He preached up a storm. And when he was finished, he was just sure that God was going to use that message in this lady. So at the end of the service, back in the old days, he stood at the back. People filed by. Nice sermon, pastor. Nice sermon, pastor. Nice sermon, pastor. And they walked by. And then the lady came up to him. She walked directly up to him took his hand in both of her hands, looked him square in the eye and said, thank you so much, Pastor, for that sermon. There are some people here that really needed to hear that. (laughs) He He decided never to try to do that again. Well, evidently, Paul had heard that some form of spiritual pride is creeping into the church, and he's reminding them that grace is humbling because it's not about us. Remember we taught this passage a couple of weeks ago, Ephesians chapter 2, Paul again writing, he says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, it's hard to be prideful when you realize you're dead in your trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so no one may boast. So he's reminding these young Christians in Rome and reminding us that the whole point of grace is that it's not about us. It's about God. Third, I think he's pointing toward the extraordinary gifts of God's grace. He finishes his thought, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. So we're not to think too highly of ourselves. We're not to have a sense of spiritual pride, but we are to think soberly or correctly about ourselves. What does that mean? Well, it means understanding that when we put our faith in Christ, we receive three gifts. First, the gift of salvation, forgiveness from sin, and the great promise of eternal life, salvation. Secondly, the gift of of being included in the community called the church. And thirdly, the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, in the very first Christian sermon, uh, uh, Peter is speaking, and he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That leads us to the second thing I want to talk about out of this passage, and that is the gifts of the Spirit. Excuse me, the Spirit of grace. You have the Spirit of humility and the Spirit of grace. Years ago, um, I... I had a chance to travel to China with a basketball team with sports ambassadors. It was a Christian group. Our purpose in going there was to build friendship with the Chinese Sports Federation and and to encourage the the church at that time. It was 1982, one of the first Western teams to go into that part of China. We played in some major cities in China. And um, in Beijing, we stayed at a hotel. And one night, uh, I couldn't sleep due to jet lag or whatever. And I walked out... uh, to get a drink of water or something, and I, and I met a young man, almost exactly my age, from Egypt. And he spoke English, and he wanted to speak English, so we sat late at night in this hallway of this hotel, just talked. I'd never met anybody from Egypt before, and our conversation um, eventually got around to religion. And he was Muslim, and I'm a Christian, and I'd never had a conversation with a Muslim person before. And so we had this hours-long conversation deep into the night, And when I talked about God, he talked about Allah. And when I talked about Jesus, he talked about Muhammad. When I talked about the Bible, he talked about the Quran. And then I said somewhere, I made a reference to the Holy Spirit. And he said, wait, wait, go back, go back. What is this Holy Spirit of which you speak? I was surprised because he hadn't been interested in anything really I had to say up until that point. Because he just countered with something out of Islam. This time he was interested. So I, I did the best I could to explain the Holy Spirit, which isn't easy sometimes. And after I did the best I could, which was probably a pretty lousy job, he went, no, we have nothing like that in Islam. We have nothing like that. Francis Chan is a pastor. He's written a book called The Forgotten God. It's about the Holy Spirit. And in this book, he has this quote. He writes, from my perspective, 
the Holy Spirit is tragically neglected and for all practical purposes forgotten. While no Christian would deny his existence, I'm willing to bet there are millions of churchgoers across America who cannot confidently say they've experienced his presence or action in their lives over the past year, and many of them do not believe they can. Now, I think some of our struggle to understand the Holy Spirit has to do with the nature of the Spirit himself, because the scriptures tell us that the purpose of the Spirit is not to draw attention to himself, but to point us to Christ himself. But secondly, I think our language has a problem because we often say things like, I felt God's presence in worship today, or I feel the Lord leading me when I read scripture, and we're really referring to activities and work of the Holy Spirit. We just don't name the Spirit by name a lot of times. So let's take a detour here and talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit because it's important. Paul is assuming that his readers understand this. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul writes, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. See, Paul is teaching us here, and this is what some of you may not know, is that if you've put your faith in Jesus for salvation, you have received the gift of grace, that is the forgiveness of sin and the promise of salvation. But you've also received, according to the scriptures, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, what or who is the Holy Spirit? Theologically speaking, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. That's how theologians talk. God exists eternally in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, who's Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. Practically speaking, this is how I think about it, oversimplified, but practically speaking, God the Father is the creator of all things, sovereign over all the universe. Jesus was the incarnation of God in the flesh. He came in order to be the final sacrifice for the sins of the world, and the Holy Spirit then is the presence of Jesus in spiritual form who dwells in the hearts and lives of believers. Okay, make sense? We need to know that the Holy Spirit was promised by Jesus himself before He went to the cross. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, advocate, or counselor, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Okay, so Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, and when I put my faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit enters my heart and my life, And by the way, when you came to faith in Christ, you may have been intensely aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. You may have experienced that as an emotional, powerful time, or you may have experienced that more like the signing of a contract, not particularly emotional at all, with a kind of certainty. It's a mysterious thing, but it's promised. The Holy Spirit is a promise. Well, then what? What does the Holy Spirit do? Let me just tick through five primary activities of the Holy Spirit to help you understand what the Spirit is trying to do in you if you're a believer right now. First, the Spirit seals our salvation and assures us of our status. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, the Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So the Holy Spirit functions like a, like a brand new birth certificate to affirm your new identity in Christ. Secondly, the Holy Spirit reminds us of truth. Again, the words of Jesus in John 14. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So, when you're in your car, driving on your way to work, or you're in your kitchen, uh, making dinner for your family, or you're going on your evening walk, and something from God's Word, or last week's sermon, or a Bible study you're doing, comes to mind, that's the Holy Spirit at work in your heart and your mind. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit helps us when we pray. Again, Paul in Romans 8, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now for me, 
personally, this is one of the most mysterious and beautiful promises in all the Bible. Because sometimes there are just no words. Sometimes the loss that's experienced or the pain that's experienced or the brokenness that's experienced in your life or in the life of someone you dearly love is so great that there are just no words. And the promise is that even when all we can do is groan, the Holy Spirit translates those groans into prayers before the Father. It's a beautiful promise. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray. Fourth, the Holy Spirit produces spiritual growth. I mentioned this last weekend. Galatians 5 says, But the fruit of the Spirit, what the Spirit tries to grow in all our lives all the time, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, self-control. Against such, such things there is no law. So when we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit enters our hearts and goes to work. Like a home remodeling project. Ever watch those shows on TV? When they come in to remodel a home, some stuff gets torn up and thrown out completely. Some new stuff gets brought in. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. If we pay attention and allow that work to be done. Helps us to grow. Finally, the Holy Spirit brings spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So Paul wants these Christians in Rome to know and God wants us to know, first, the humility of grace. It's not about us. And he wants us to know the spirit of grace. The Holy Spirit dwells in the heart and life of every follower of Christ and is trying to do those five things. So we're going to wrap up by talking about the third thing we see in this text, and that is the gifts of grace. The gifts of grace. I was surprised a couple of weeks ago when I got an email from my old high school football coach, a man named Phil Gennaro, who I just know simply as Coach J. Those of you who go to team and hear me talk about stories of Coach J every year, I tell stories about him because he was my football coach for two years, two seasons, 1971 and 1972. And in those two short years, he made such an impact on my young life that we still stay in contact today. 45 years later. Well, Coach and his wife are traveling through the area, and so we invited us to join, invited them to join, invited them to join us for dinner. This is me at my home with my 75-year-old Coach Gennaro. We sat at our kitchen table for over two hours. A couple of my boys were home, and I'm sure we bored them to death, but we just started talking and telling stories and laughing and remembering the good old days. And there was one story that I've told to my boys a number of times, and um, I was wondering how Coach Jay remembered it, if he didn't remember it at all, because it was 45 years ago. So I asked him about it, and he told the story almost exactly the way I've told it to my boys through the years, so they knew I was telling the truth. It was my junior year, about the fourth game of the season. I had sprained my ankle very early in the preseason and, and had not been able to play in any game so far. Um, I'd lost my position as a starting safety, and another guy uh, took my spot. Uh, but after, at this point in the season, four games had gone by about a month, and I was healthy again, but I couldn't get back in the field because the guy took my spot. Well, the guy who replaced me was also the punter. And during this game, he hurt his ankle. And so it got to be fourth down, and he was hurt, so we had no punter. We didn't have a backup punter. And I still remember, I'm standing on the sideline, had not been in the game all season yet. Okay? And Coach Jay is standing right in front of me, and I'd overheard some, some consternation among the coaches. I knew what was going on. We didn't have a punter. And Coach Day all of a sudden turns around. He's about this tall. He turned around and goes, who can punt? Like that. And I stood there, and before I could really think about what I was doing, I said, I can punt, Coach. And he looked at me. I'll never forget the, 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 the intensity of his, of his, it was real game time. Game's going on. It's fourth down. He looked at me. He's like this far away. He might even hook this. He used to hook his finger inside your face mask. He might even hook at me. And his little fierce little Italian eyes was, were boring into my little scrawny soul, and he was looking for a punter somewhere in there. And he hesitated for a minute, like he had his doubts, and he went, get in there and punt. And as I ran onto the field, I still remember thinking, what have I done? <laughs> I mean, I'd messed around punting with my brother in the yard. I'd never won my whole life punted in a game. But I told him I could punt. My coach, I told him I could punt. So I ran on the field, 
And when I get to the huddle and we line up, I could hear the other team going, new punter, new punter, move up, move up. And they start moving up. And I'm thinking, just help me not miss the ball. I just, I just didn't want to miss it. I was afraid I was going to miss the ball. And so I get the snap, and I step into the punt, and I hit, for, I hit it exactly right. And that ball took off like a ballistic missile. And it shot like over the guy's head, perfect spiral, hit, took like four bounces toward the other goal line, finally rolled to a stop at the other team's seven-yard line. It was a 77-yard punt. <laughs> Turned out I had a gift for punting that I had, did not know about and had never used. And I was the punter for the next two years, although I never had another 77-yard punt <laughs> the whole time. In Romans, Paul continues. Verse 4, For as in one body we have many members... And the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one of another. Now let me pause here. Paul had several favorite images with which he described the church, this new thing that God was doing, the church of Jesus Christ. He called it a building being built. He called it a family. But his favorite was this image right here, body. The church is a body, the body of Christ. And the most important things for us to understand about the church is that, first of all, the church is an expression of God's grace. It's a gift. And secondly, the church is not something we go to. The church is something that we are. There's a huge difference between going to a church and being the church. Verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now, most of us, I've learned over the years, do not think of ourselves as gifted people. We can't read 25,000 words a minute, can't hammer nails into our nose. And you know, we live in a culture of celebrity. Our whole culture worships celebrity, right? One name celebrities. LeBron, Adele, Conan. People of extraordinary talent, music, sports, or entertainment, or business. But we often translate that very worldview into this mysterious gift called the church. We assume that there are a few gifted folks. You know, the people up front playing the piano like Tommy did today or pe whoever's here doing the speaking who has the weird little mic on. We assume there are a few sort of superstars out there, and then there's sort of the rest of the ungifted bunch of us watching, spectators. Listen to me. There is no such thing as an ungifted Christian. There is no such thing as an ungifted follower of Jesus Christ. In this passage, Paul mentions gifts like prophecy, which is, Ruffled equivalent of preaching, service, teaching, exhortation, which means encouragement, generosity, and leadership. But in other places in the New Testament, he mentions many, many more gifts. Upfront gifts like teaching and leadership, behind the scenes gifts like mercy and helps and administration. And I think all of those are just examples of many, many more gifts that God gives his church through the Holy Spirit. If you combine the gifts that the Spirit gives with our unusual and unique personalities, and our life experiences, the truth is we've all received something of value from the Holy Spirit. It's just the way God does it. And this is when we get to uncomfortable grace. I haven't mentioned that phrase yet. This is where it gets uncomfortable, and I'll tell you why. Because if God became flesh and gave himself for your eternal salvation... It means you matter to him. You matter to him that much. If Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to dwell in your life when you came to faith, you matter to him. If Jesus has given you the church, this community in which you can be loved, accepted, and encouraged, where you can worship and serve, it's because you matter to him. If the Holy Spirit has given you gifts, his enablements to use in order to help build his church in the world, you matter to him. You matter to him in that he loves you, 
forgives you, saves you, but you also matter to him because he's invested his resources in you. And he's invested those resources to be used. In that same book, Francis Chan writes, what would your church look like if everyone was as committed as you are? If everyone gave and served and prayed exactly like you, would the church be healthy and empowered, or would it be weak and listless? I had to read that paragraph a couple times because it, it struck me. To make it more personal, what if I said it this way? If every single person in Chapel Street Church, both our campuses and soon a third campus, served with exactly the kind of energy, passion, and sacrifice as you do, if every single person was exactly as generous as you are with your resources, how would we be doing? Would we be trying half the stuff that we're doing right now or twice as much? So how do you know? How do you know what your gifts are? Two things you can do. Ask. Ask. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you see the gifts he's already given you. He'll tell you. Because he's already at work. Secondly, try stuff. Just try stuff. When I said I could punt, I had no idea. I just wanted to be in the game. Right? Try stuff. And you don't have to preach sermons. You don't have to hammer nails in your nose. You can hammer with uh, master's hands. Do, do, do work projects for, for widows and, and, and people who are going through a difficult time in life. You can sit with and play with children with special needs at buddy break. You can stuff a food bag and bring it to Shepherd's Heart. You can help people with their finances with Shepherd's Heart. There's a zillion things you can do to find out how God has gifted you because he has. Here's the point. If you're a follower of Christ today, you've been saved by grace. It's not of your own works. You can't do anything to earn it. You didn't earn it, and you can't earn it. You've been saved by grace. It's not about you. But you've also been gifted by grace. That is, you have a specific function in this body. The New Testament says that God has arranged all the parts exactly how he wants them. I have no idea how he does that. That's his promise. You bring something that no one else can bring because you matter. That's what Paul's saying. The first and most important step for me and putting together a sermon, and this is what I teach our, our younger uh, pastors and preachers, the most, first and most important step is to discover what I call the emotional center of a passage, the thrust of it. This tells you what your target is. This helps you understand what God is most trying to say. It, what, what helps you find stories and illustrations. You've got to find the heart of the passage. Sometimes it's easy and obvious. It just jumps out at you. And sometimes you have to dig a little harder. It's a little more obscure. This text, for me, the way it was cut, the way it was handed to me to preach, was a little bit the second. It was harder wasn't quite as obvious. Was, I knew there was lots of good stuff in here. I knew about Romans. I knew there was stuff about humility and grace and gifts. But I struggled to find the very center of it. What's the center of it? So I kept reading it over and over again. Even as I put together the sermon, I read it. What is the center? What is the center? What is the center? Finally, I saw it, I think. It's four little words so ordinary that the first ten times I read it, I just passed right over them. See if you can hear them. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. Let us use them. I think that's the center. That's what Paul wanted to say to this church in Rome so many years ago. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us. I have invested my gifts in you. Use them. Let's use them. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you for your word that we looked at again today. We thank you for your grace, grace that we struggle to understand, grace so powerful, so big, that we can spend the rest of our lives trying to understand. By grace we are saved. By grace we receive your spirit that dwells in us. By grace we are included in your church. By grace we are given gifts. So teach us, encourage us, compel us to use them for your purpose.
and your glory. Amen. Would you stand us, with us for the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. As you leave tonight, don't forget to pick up a Shepherd Talk food bag if you're able to do that. We appreciate your generosity very much. The benediction tonight I've chosen is from a different New Testament writer, the Apostle Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 4, he writes this. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Have a great weekend.